Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that today, September 30th, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, where we reflect on and honor the lost children and survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and communities. The CLSA National Coordinating Center in Hamilton is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with, Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Our presenters uh, who will be hearing from today are based at Western University, which is settled on the traditional lands of the Anishabek, uh, Haudenosaunee, uh, Linapawak, and Attawandaran peoples. As attendees of the webinar today, I encourage everyone to learn more and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to do our research, live and work wherever that may be, and to work towards truth and reconciliation as outlined in the TRC calls to action. Now on to today's webinar. Again, it's entitled Sleep and Health Across the Lifespan, an Epidemiological Perspective, presented by Re Rebecca Rodriguez and Dr. Severio uh, Stranges. Uh, Rebecca is a project coordinator in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western. She focuses on research related to sleep health, mental health, and the social determinants of health. Uh, Dr. Severio Stranges is a professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western and is cross-appointed with the Department of Family Medicine. He is also a scientific advisor in the Department of Population Health at the Luxembourg Institute of Health in Luxembourg. Um, his research focuses on the epidemiology and prevention of chronic diseases and aging, specifically regarding the role of lifestyles uh, nutrition and social lifestyles, nutrition and psychosocial factors, such as dietary patterns, sleep behaviors, and social factors in cardiovascular health. So now I will pass it along to our presenters today. Just take your mute off, Severia. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. There we go. So good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity um, to talk about our research on sleep and health across the lifespan on this um, uh, special day for Canada. So I feel the privilege to discuss about this topic on behalf of uh, a larger team a Western University and also um, in other institutions. Um, and uh, with my uh, co-presenter, Rebecca Rodriguez, we will try to uh, discuss some of the most recent findings based also on the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. But my presentation will uh, really try to provide a broad uh, background context to this um, um, topic of sleep, an important sleep health across the lifespan. We will discuss about some of the epidemiological trends, uh, the evidence on the association between sleep and chronic disease, some of the issues around um, transitioning from association to causation and challenges and open questions in this field. Obviously the importance of sleep to um, general well-being, both physical and mental, has been recognized for a long, long time. Hippocrates uh, used to say, in whatever disease, sleep is laborious, it's a deadly symptom, but if sleep doesn't good, it's not deadly. So we're talking about several years ago. And um, we're supposed to spend one third of our lives sleeping. So we can assume that if there is an alteration to both uh, the duration of quality of sleep, that may have an impact on our well-being. And also we need to acknowledge that um, our sleep habits tend to change over time because of uh, um, adjustment or changes in the circadian rhythm 
as we get older. But uh, it is also important that uh, sleep uh, is a multi-dimensional uh, construct, which is influenced by a range of factors, which are not just individual factors like genetic makeup or other physiological or behavioral um, factors, but also the social and the environment uh, play a major role in shaping our uh, sleep patterns and therefore also the potential associations with a range of health outcomes. In the last few years, there has been increasing public health concern around the um, prevalence of sleep disorders and sleep deprivation as an unmet public health issue. And this was a report from the Institute of Medicine emphasizing that uh, sleep seems to be still outside the radar in terms of public health priorities. And uh, there is also evidence on the economic and societal impact of sleep uh, problems in high income countries in terms of direct, indirect consequences uh, to society uh, uh, financially um, in terms of burden to the healthcare system and also to the work uh, sector as well. But the sleep problems are not just the problem of um, high income countries. There is also evidence on the impact of sleep problems in low and middle income countries. This was, for example, a study we did a few years ago with WHO uh, showing that uh, sleep problems tend to be highly prevalent. Also in, uh, uh, for example, African Asian countries. In particular, in this uh, study, we look at self-reported sleep problems uh, across eight different countries. In Asian Africans, uh, there was a uh, um, high prevalence in some of these countries and also consistent result of uh, uh, higher prevalence self-reported sleep problems among women, which is in line also with evidence from uh, high-income countries. So overall, the field of sleep uh, epidemiology is rapidly growing and there is a, an exponential increase in the number of publications in this field, uh, suggesting that uh, sleep as a behavior should be uh, given uh, sufficient attention alongside with the traditional modifiable risk factors in chronic disease epidemiology, such as smoking, poor diet, physical activity, uh, obesity, and so on. And uh, uh, as I said before, there is public health concern because uh, the epidemiological data seems to uh, suggest that, for example, duration of sleep may be declining the last few years. This was a study we did a few years ago using data from the Canadian National Population Health Survey, where we identify uh, four different categories of sleepers within the Canadian population. And there was a consistent trend in declining sleep duration over time across the five time points of the study. Very recently, uh, this was published just uh, a few weeks ago, we also look at the association of sleep problems with other health behaviors, including smoking, uh, binge drinking, and diet uh, within the Canadian Community Health Service on a very large population. And actually, we also found that a large segment of the population in Canada does not uh, meet the recommended sleep duration guidelines. And also, uh, even uh, over 55% of females and over 40% of males may report uh, sleep problems. We also found associations of binge drinking and smoking with increased risk of sleep problems. On the other hand, increased fruit and vegetable consumption was associated with a lower risk of uh, uh, sleep problems. So the other important aspect in uh, uh, the field of sleep epidemiology is the overwhelming evidence on the association of sleep problems with a range of chronic diseases. For example, there have been studies suggesting associations with risk of cardiometabolic conditions and disease, uh, with the increased risk of cancer and neurodegenerative disease with mental disorders, multimorbidity, and overall and co-specific mortality. In particular, in the field of cardiometabolic disease, uh, there is suggestion that perhaps we should consider poor sleep as an emerging risk factor for cardiovascular disease, given also the uh, evidence on potential mechanisms in terms of biological pathways 
which will uh, increase the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, including inflammatory processes or, uh, for example, hormone responses in relation to poor sleep and uh, um, the potential impact on cardiometabolic health. The American Heart Association recently uh, disclosed a statement on the importance of incorporating sleep duration and quality in uh, um, the assessment of cardiometabolic health. As I said, there is evidence on the impact of sleep problems in terms of mortality risk. This was a study we did in South Africa where people with uh, um, sleep problems will have reduced uh, or increased risk of mortality and reduced survival. Other studies uh, have suggested U-shaped association in relation to the, uh, um, the association between sleep duration and total mortality, whereby uh, both short uh, sleep and long sleep may increase the risk of mortality. Overall, there is a need to look at uh, the, the potential health implication of sleep in a life course perspective, because the implication of uh, sleep problems may occur at very early stage. For example, we found uh, associations between poor sleep and internalizing problems in early adolescence in using data from the Canadian Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth. Likewise, we also find associations between sleep, poor sleep and risk of multimorbidity from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, which will be discussed by Rebecca uh, in a few minutes. Of course, these epidemiological uh, associations do not necessarily um, infer that there is a, a causal association between sleep and, and range of health outcomes. And therefore, we uh, should also consider poor sleep as a potential risk marker for ill health. And there are uh, considerations that need to be um, done before assessing the causation of these links. For example, it's important to look at the uh, potential correlates of sleep uh, patterns in terms of socio-demographic uh, profiles. And we have tried to do this across different populations. In other words, we have tried to identify who are the short and the long sleepers or people with a, a poor quality sleep within the general population in terms of the socio-demographic profile. And also we have uh, assessed geographic variations in terms of sleep patterns across Canada. And we also found striking geographic variations, both within and across provinces. So what are the open question in the field of uh, uh, sleep epidemiology, especially in the link between sleep and chronic disease? Well, first of all, we need to um, distinguish between the evidence uh, on uh, clinically sleep disorders versus behavioral sleep problems in the general population. We also need to consider the range of comorbidities of sleep problems, which may account for some of the epidemiological associations we have observed. We also, uh, again, need to discuss about bidirectional relationship, reverse causation, and the issue of temporality, especially um, in cross-sectional studies, and trying to capture the multi-level influence by individual so social and societal level factors, which obviously influence our uh, sleep patterns. Uh, we need to corroborate biological plausibility. And one important issue is the assessment of sleep in epidemiological studies, uh, subjective versus objective measure of sleep over time. And this is a critical issue because most of the uh, epidemiological studies, in particular those with the large samples, have relied on self-reporting information. Uh, and, and we know that there are problems in terms of misclassification recall bias. Uh, of course, there are objective measures such as polysomnography or actigraphy that may be uh, more suitable, but uh, again, it's also the feasibility of using those objective measures in large population-based studies. Epidemiological studies should be able also to capture changes in sleep patterns over time, and also the question around biomarkers as at the moment, we do not really have reliable biomarkers which can, uh, in a sense, uh, reflect sleep patterns. So in terms of the public health implication of sleep problems, overall, there is concern on the high prevalence, uh, both in high income and low middle income countries, everyone uh, is exposed. There is a large burden of accidents caused by excessive sleepiness. As we say, the potential increase in burden of several chronic disease driven by 
poor sleep, the economic burden in terms of healthcare and society. And we also, we also should acknowledge the little attention to sleep still in clinical training and clinical practices, also the little attention to sleep in public health circles and primary care. And finally, it is also concerning that poor sleep may contribute to widening health disparities because of the strong association with socio-demographic profiles. Uh, these are some of the study populations from which uh, the research we have done uh, come from. And just I would like to acknowledge, again, the large team uh, we have at Western University, in particular also uh, Rebecca Rodriguez, who will speak uh, next to some of our funding bodies, as well as national and international partners. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Strangis, for the overview of the importance of sleep. Uh, so for my presentation, I'm going to share some of our findings on sleep and health among middle-aged and older adults using data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And so first off, I just want to acknowledge the team of people who have contributed to the research projects that I'll be presenting here today. So as we just heard from Dr. Strange's evidence suggests that a healthy lifestyle includes healthy sleep, healthy sleep um, and sleep problems are highly prevalent globally and here in Canada. So this, this is data from the Public Health Agency of Canada showing that many Canadians have poor sleep habits with as many as one in three adults age 35 to 64 and one in four age 65 to 79 sleeping fewer hours than the recommended minimum and as many as one in two reporting poor sleep quality. So in the context of an aging population, disruptions in sleep duration and sleep quality are highly prevalent among middle-aged and older adults. And this may be due to medical and psychiatric illness, changes in lifestyle and social engagement, which accompany aging, which may in turn contribute to sleep problems. So given that sleep tends to be an issue among middle-aged and older adults in particular, it's important to understand the mental and physical health correlates of poor sleep in this population, as well as the subgroups of people who are more likely to have poor sleep. So we know that sleep problems are highly prevalent in the Canadian population in middle-aged and older adults, and that sleep problems such as short and long sleep duration and poor sleep quality are associated with an increased risk for a number of chronic diseases. But associations between sleep patterns and the accumulation of multiple chronic conditions or multimorbidity remains unclear. There's pretty limited evidence on associations with this outcome. And multimorbidity is a particularly relevant health outcome for middle-aged and older adults as chronic conditions accumulate with age. And as well, regarding sleep and mental health associations, um, population-based data you know, beyond clinical samples and people with sleep disorders are limited, and particularly in the Canadian context. And associations between sleep problems and health outcomes are further complicated when we consider that not everyone has the same likelihood of sleeping poorly. So as Dr. Strange has just discussed, there's a wide range of socioecological factors that contribute to sleep disparities. Um, and this is important since sleep disparities are under-recognized contributors to health disparities in disadvantaged groups. So a number of sleep disparities across different socioeconomic groups and different racial ethnic minority groups have been well documented in American settings. So low socioeconomic status is associated with shorter sleep duration, poor sleep quality, delayed onset, and more fragmented sleep. And one of the most widely studied disparities in the US is between black and white racial groups. So evidence suggests that black people have shorter sleep duration than white people sleeping about 28 minutes less per night according to objective measurements and about 15 minutes less according to subjective sleep duration measures. And these small differences add up to really large gaps in sleep duration over time. As well, Latin, Asian and indigenous adults have shorter sleep duration as well. And there's poor sleep quality in these groups relative to white people. But importantly, there really is a lack of Canadian evidence on the subgroups of people more likely to have poor sleep, um, particularly among middle-aged and older adults. So as we know that sleep problems are highly prevalent in middle-aged and older adults in Canada, we wanted to explore the associations between sleep problems and different health outcomes that are important in the context of an aging population including multimorbidity and poor mental health. 
And upstream of these sleep problems, we were further interested in understanding the subgroups of people more likely to have poor sleep, which would contribute to health disparities. So to investigate these aims, we used data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So for those of you attending who are maybe unfamiliar, um, the CLSA is a large national and comprehensive study on aging in Canada, with data being collected from over 50,000 Canadians over the age of 45 at baseline, and data collection will span 20 years. So the CLSA includes two cohorts. There is the tracking cohort, of about 20,000 people who were randomly selected within the 10 provinces, and they completed telephone questionnaires. And there's a comprehensive cohort of about 30,000 people randomly selected who live within 25 to 50 kilometers of 11 data collection sites across seven provinces. So you can see on the map here where the data collection sites are located in red. And for the comprehensive cohort, interviews were completed in person. So for our study, we used the comprehensive cohort uh, due to the availability of the sleep module questions in the sample. And specifically, we used baseline data from the comprehensive cohort, which were collected between 2012 and 2015. So for our work related to sleep and health in the CLSA, we primarily focused on these two measures of sleep. So first we focused on sleep duration, since this is widely known to be a problem in the general population. Many people don't get enough sleep. And there's also evidence of associations with adverse health outcomes of both short and long sleep, as Dr. Stranges discussed earlier. So the sleep duration question in the CLSA asks, during the past month on average, how many hours of actual sleep did you get at night? This may be different than the number of hours you spend in bed. And we considered less than six hours to be short duration and normal to be six to eight and long more than eight hours. So the six hour cutoff was selected for a few reasons um, based on recommendations from the National Sleep Foundation, which states that less than six hours of sleep in adults is not recommended. Um, and the eight hour cutoff was selected for long sleep based on the distribution of sleep duration in the CLSA sample which you'll see in a minute on the next slide, um, this group is quite small. And these cutoffs also align with similar previous studies in this area. So the other measure we were interested in was sleep quality, which is a more holistic measure of sleep. Um, and it's also less prone to problems with misclassification between subjective versus objective measurement as sleep duration is. So the sleep quality question in the CLSA asks, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with your current sleep pattern? And among CLSA participants, the average sleep duration was 6.8 hours per night um, and 13% reported short sleep duration, so less than six hours and 5% long duration, according to our categorization. So overall short sleep is a more prevalent problem than long sleep in this group. And for sleep quality, 27% of CLSA participants reported poor sleep quality as dissatisfaction with the current sleep pattern, whereas 59% were satisfied with their sleep and 15% were neutral. So in general, poor sleep quality is uh, more of a prevalent problem than abnormal sleep duration. So the aim of our first study examining the sleep health associations in the CLSA was to understand the associations between sleep patterns and multimorbidity among middle-aged and older adults in Canada. And this project was led by Dr. Catherine Nicholson and was published in Sleep Medicine last year, um, if you're interested in reading up for more details. So to identify chronic conditions in the CLSA sample to define more multimorbidity, we used a series of questions, has a doctor ever told you that you have X condition? And we explored multiple definitions of multimorbidity, um, including a primary care definition, and this includes 17 chronic conditions listed here. So the, um, these conditions were selected based on their relevance to primary care service, services and um, due to the impact on affected patients. And we also used a public health definition, which includes nine chronic conditions, 
And these conditions were selected by an expert working group at the Public Health Agency of Canada and were selected based on um, their chronic duration, the high population prevalence in Canada, significant societal and economic impact, and also the amenability to primary prevention. And we further used two cutoffs for each definition. So either two or more chronic conditions from each list and three or more chronic conditions from each list. So for our approach, we conducted a cross-sectional analysis of the baseline comprehensive cohort. And in this analysis, we modeled sleep variables as independent variables and multimorbidity as the dependent variables. And for sleep duration, we compared the categories of short and long versus normal. And for sleep quality, we compared satisfied and dissatisfied versus neutral. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, with our two measures of multimorbidity and two cutoffs, we had four multimorbidity outcomes. And for the analysis, we used modified Poisson regression with sampling weights to estimate prevalence ratios for the prevalence of multimorbidity in each sleep exposure group. And we adjusted our models with a number of sociodemographic variables, such as age, sex, education level, uh, some lifestyle variables, such as alcohol and tobacco consumption, and physical activity. And we also adjusted for some clinical variables, um, including BMI and hypertension. And so this was for the public health definition only. Um, since those conditions are actually part of the primary care definition of multimorbidity. So shown here is the prevalence of multimorbidity within the CLSA comprehensive cohort participants at baseline. So 28% met the public health definition for multimorbidity, including at least two chronic conditions. Um, and the smallest group was the three plus group with the public health definition at uh, 10%. So prevalence was much higher for the primary care definition um, since this definition includes a much wider range of conditions. So we had 63% for two or more chronic conditions and 42% for three or more conditions. And here are the results for the adjusted associations between sleep duration and multimorbidity. So the y-axis shows the adjusted prevalence ratio in which we modeled the prevalence of each multimorbidity outcome in each sleep duration group, adjusting for sociodemographic lifestyle and clinical variables. And the error bars shown here represent the 95% confidence intervals around our parameter estimates. So both short duration in blue and long duration in green were associated with a higher prevalence of multimorbidity across all definitions as compared to normal sleep duration. And in particular, the associations were largest with the three plus public health definition um, with prevalence ratios of 1.3 for short sleep and 1.56 for long sleep compared to normal. So overall, we observed a U-shaped association between short and long sleep duration and multimorbidity. And this is a trend that has been similarly observed for other chronic disease and adverse health outcomes. So for sleep quality, we again observed significant adjusted associations across all multimorbidity definitions with dissatisfaction in sleep in blue associated with a higher prevalence of multimorbidity where satisfaction with sleep in, or in green uh, was associated with a lower prevalence of multimorbidity. So overall, we observed that both measures of sleep, abnormal sleep duration and sleep quality, were pretty consistently associated with multimorbidity in the CLSA sample. So for the second study in this project, our objective was to understand the associations between sleep patterns and mental health among middle-aged and older adults in Canada. We explored a number of different measures of mental health. So we examined self-reported mental health with the question, in general, would you say your mental health is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? And we dichotomized answers as fair or poor versus excellent, very good, or good. 
And we also use the satisfaction with life skill, which is a validated measure of subjective well being. And we dichotomize the overall score on the scale as dissatisfied with life versus people who are neutral or satisfied. And finally, we also use the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, or K10, with a cutoff score of 15 or more to indicate psychological distress. And this cutoff has been associated with the best balance of sensitivity and specificity in older adults for screening people for anxiety or affective disorders. So again, this was a cross-sectional analysis of the baseline comprehensive cohort. And we use the same sleep variables and categories as in the multimorbidity analysis. Also similar to the multimorbidity analysis, we modeled the sleep measures as independent variables and the mental health measures as dependent variables. And again, we used modified Poisson regression with sampling weights to estimate prevalence ratios, modeling the prevalence of poor mental health in each sleep group. And we similarly adjusted for a number of sociodemographic lifestyle and clinical covariates as before. So poor mental health and well-being within the CLSA participants was quite low. So only 6% reported their mental health as poor or fair compared to 94% reporting it as good, very good or excellent. 12% were dissatisfied with life, um, whereas 88% were neutral or satisfied. Um, and 36% of participants had some psychological distress as measured with the K-10. So here are the results for the associations between sleep duration and mental health. So short sleep in blue was associated with a higher prevalence of poor self-reported mental health, dissatisfaction with life, and psychological distress relative to normal sleep duration. And similarly, long sleep duration in green was associated with a higher prevalence of poor self-reported mental health and psychological distress, um, but it was not associated with dissatisfaction with life. For sleep quality, we observed that dissatisfaction with sleep compared to neutral in blue was consistently associated with a higher prevalence of poor mental health across all outcomes. Uh, with prevalence ratios ranging from 1.46 for poor self-reported mental health to 1.18 for psychological distress. And those reporting satisfaction with sleep had a lower prevalence of poor mental health compared to neutral. So overall, our findings were generally very consistent with our multimorbidity analysis, showing that both short and long sleep duration and sleep quality were associated with poor mental health. So moving on to focus on the factors that are associated with sleep problems in the CLSA. The objective for our third study was to identify the social determinants of poor sleep health among middle-aged and older adults in Canada. So shown here are the specific social determinants we were interested in. And we focused on the individual level social determinants rather than the broad ecological measures as shown in the Billings and colleagues framework um, that we showed in the introduction. And we derived this list using multiple sources. So on the left are the social determinants of health that are important to measure according to Kai Hai. So this includes sex um, or gender, but we only have access to sex in the CLSA baseline sample age, geographic location, so rural or urban residents, annual household income, and educational attainment. And on the right are additional social determinants that have been shown to be important in the sleep literature. So this includes marital status, employment, home ownership, migrant status, racial and ethnic minority groups, and sexual orientation. So for this analysis, Again, we focused on sleep duration and sleep quality, but in this case, we added in an additional measure of sleep um, to be consistent with a number of prior studies in this area. So we also looked at sleep disturbance, which we defined as difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep three times a week or more over the past month. 
So yet again, this is a cross-sectional analysis of baseline data from the comprehensive cohort. And for this analysis, we modeled sleep as the outcome variable. So sleep duration, we modeled as a continuous variable rather than categorizing into short, normal, and long categories. And we dichotomized sleep quality and sleep disturbance variables. Social determinant variables were modeled then as independent variables. And we used modified Poisson regression with sampling weights to model the prevalence of poor sleep quality and sleep disturbance. And we used linear regression to model sleep duration. So in this case, we used a blockwise adjustment approach. So first we adjusted for all social determinants together to identify the key social determinants independently associated with sleep in our sample. And then we adjusted for a number of clinical and lifestyle variables to see whether these factors might account for some of the associations we observed. So shown here are the key groups where we saw poor sleep patterns and at least one indicator. So these are the results from the models where we adjusted for all social determinants together. So females were more likely to report both sleep disturbance and uh, sleep quality compared to males. People who are widowed or divorced were more likely to report sleep disturbance compared to people who are single or never married. And people who are employed or unemployed have shorter sleep duration compared to the retired group. Um, and as well, people who are unemployed also were more likely to report uh, poor sleep quality. And among racial ethnic minority groups, um, we observed significantly shorter sleep duration in Black, East Asian, and other mixed race groups compared to white. So these differences amount to about 20 to 22 minutes less sleep each night in the Black and East Asian groups, which is a substantial difference. So this is also consistent with the sleep health inequalities observed in the US, although we did not observe any differences in sleep quality um, across these groups, as has been noted in the US. So shown here are the groups where we observed better sleep health or groups where sleep problems were less prevalent. So older age groups had better sleep across all indicators as compared to the youngest age group of 45 to 54. And there even looked to be some indications of a gradient effect with sleep patterns improving as age groups increase, um, and in particular with sleep duration. Income was another factor that mattered. So higher income groups were less likely to report sleep disturbance and poor sleep quality. And we also observed better sleep, so longer sleep duration and less sleep disturbance in the groups with higher levels of education. Um, and these associations were larger as levels of education increased. So continuing with a few more groups that had better sleep health, People who are homeowners um, have longer sleep duration and a lower prevalence of sleep disturbance compared to people who are not homeowners, um, although these effects are relatively small for this factor. Among racial ethnic minority groups, the South Asian group had a lower prevalence of poor sleep quality relative to the white group, so they had better sleep. And the lesbian, gay, bisexual group had longer sleep duration than the heterose heterosexual group. Uh, which was surprising, and we expected to observe poorer sleep in this group um, based on trends in the literature. So we then adjusted for a number of lifestyle clinical variables um, to see whether or not these associations might be accounted for in lifestyle clinical differences between groups. And we observed that associations were attenuated for a couple of factors, so household income and unemployment. Uh, but all other associations persisted and didn't really change substantially with adjustment. So who sleeps well in Canada? Well, we found some groups were less likely to have poor sleep. So people from older age groups above age 55 with higher household income and higher education, homeowners, the lesbian, gay, bisexual group, and South Asians. And on the opposite end, on the right, uh, groups that were more likely to have poor sleep 
were females relative to males, people who are widowed or divorced uh, versus single and never married, employed or unemployed versus retired, uh, Black, East Asian, and other mixed race groups relative to white. And in the middle are the groups where we didn't observe any associations with poor sleep patterns. So people living in rural areas uh, compared to urban, um, first generation migrants, and Latin American and Arab and Middle Eastern groups compared to white. Um, we didn't observe any, any differences in these groups. So some important limitations to consider with our findings. So the data we used are cross-sectional, so you can't infer any causality, um, which is particularly important to consider along with our findings on the associations between sleep, mental health, and multimorbidity. Uh, we used self-reported measures of sleep, um, which in particular is an issue for sleep duration and is prone to misclassification. So people tend to overestimate sleep, sleep duration as compared to objective measures. And as with any survey, there are some issues with selection bias in the CLSA. So comprehensive cohort includes people living close to the data collection sites, which limits the sample to people living close to these large urban centers in only seven provinces. And so that limits the generalizability of our findings. And the interviews are conducted in English or French. So this likely contributes to an underrepresentation of certain groups like recent migrants, ethnic minority groups, and people with disabilities like hearing problems or memory impairment. So we found that sleep problems, including short and long sleep duration and poor sleep quality are consistently associated with a higher prevalence of important health outcomes in an aging population, including both multimorbidity and poor mental health. And these associations are likely bi-directional. So poor sleep can negatively impact physical and mental health, which can in turn negatively impact sleep. And we also observed that sleep health disparities exist um, among different socioeconomic and racial ethnic minority groups among middle-aged and older adults in Canada, which is con a concerning finding um, and may contribute to or exacerbate um, existing health inequalities in these groups. So our findings, when considered alongside you know, the abundance of longitudinal evidence from the sleep literature, um, as presented earlier by Dr. Stranges, suggests that sleep problems do have important public health and clinical implications. So from a public health perspective, as sleep problems are a modifiable risk factor, they might be a potential target for public health interventions um, and could potentially reduce the risk of chronic disease and poor mental health. And as Dr. Strange has also mentioned in clinical settings, sleep problems aren't given as much attention as other lifestyle factors. Um, and since sleep problems in older adults are under-recognized in clinical settings, opportunities for intervention are then missed. So our findings, again, alongside you know, the mounting evidence of health correlates of poor sleep in the literature suggests that um, recognition and intervention of sleep problems, um, such as an abnormal sleep duration, or poor sleep quality may be important in clinical settings, um, either to reduce the risk of chronic disease um, or just as a marker of poor health. So overall, our findings do support the notion that uh, poor sleep warrants increased attention as a public health and clinical problem among middle-aged and older adults in Canada. So there are a number of open questions regarding sleep health associations that we plan to pursue for future projects to build on this work. So first, this includes looking at the longitudinal associations between sleep patterns, multimorbidity, and mental health um, using follow-up data from the CLSA. And so this will be really important um, to build on the cross-sectional analysis that I presented today. And we're currently working on a project investigating the neighborhood level environmental correlates of sleep problems using the CLSA CANU data linkage. And we also plan to look at the associations between sleep problems and health service use and costs using survey data and health administrative data linkages in order to better understand the health system impacts of poor sleep in Canada, uh, which is an under investigated area. So I'd like to acknowledge all the team members who contributed to this project, uh, in particular, Dr. Stranges and Dr. Kelly Anderson, who are the co-PIs on this project. 
uh, as well as Ray Alonzo, who assisted with a number of statistical analyses, um, and Dr. Catherine Nicholson, who led the multimorbidity analysis. As well, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Lawson and CIHR for funding. So thank you for attending today, um, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I do see we have some questions that have come in. Um, just a reminder, if you can use the Q&A that is located uh, below the presentation, that just helps us keep track of questions better. Um, but I will tr will go through, there, there was a few that came in on the chat as well. So um, I think maybe we'll just start there. Um, first of all, um, Shirley at the CLSA did post a link to the paper, so thank you very much for doing that. That's in the chat. Um, and one question that came in, uh, first question from Andrea was uh, for Severio, could you explain about the correlation between sleeping patterns and geographical distribution? Is there any specific factors like weather, demographics, kind of jobs in that area? Yes, uh, that is an excellent uh, question, and I was pleased to see the um, future direction slide of Rebecca because we are actually looking at that uh, particular aspect uh, with our ongoing um, Catalyst grant and the data linkage with the Kanue, the data which provides, as you know, a wealth of information on environmental um, exposures. Uh, obviously, the paper I was mentioning before is based on uh, Canadian Community Health Survey data, mm -hmm. where the information on environmental exposures is quite limited. And as you know, in environmental epidemiology, it's often difficult to capture uh, a granular information within uh, uh, current national surveys. So we hope that uh, by uh, looking at these uh, linked data from Canoe we can uh, provide more um, specific um, information about you know, potential environmental factors which may account for the geographic variations we have observed in our studies where the um, geographic um, unit was the uh, forward sortation area uh, within uh, each provinces. And obviously we accounted also for uh, a range of sociodemographic factors to make sure that that was not, uh, although is one of the potential, you know, explanation for those geographic variations, but the uh, variations seem to um, hold even after accounting for uh, sociodemographic uh, differences. Um, so I think the um, project, uh, the ongoing project will provide more, uh, more additional information. I don't think in the overall body of evidence, there is really uh, consistent findings on a specific, you know, obviously we know that uh, sleep is multidimensional and there is a range of uh, environmental factors which are likely to contribute, but I don't think we have uh, definitive evidence in this particular area. Great, thank you. Uh, and another question is that research by Sarah Arbor from the UK finds that women who are coupled are more experiencing, are often experiencing interrupted sleep because of spouse's sleep challenges. Would this contribute to accounting for women's greater sleep issues? Yeah, that's another great question. I'm very pleased. Uh, and, and this is another, you know, um, area of research on, on sex gender differences in the association between sleep and uh, health outcomes. Certainly, the mechanism that this colleague has put forward is, uh, is uh, extremely plausible. You know, we, we uh, did a, a number of studies looking at the association of uh, uh, sleep deprivation, in particular with the cardiometabolic outcomes. And we found, for example, that women seem to have a potential higher risk of uh, hypertension and also cardiovascular disease in general, uh, not necessarily the same. Uh, was found in men, and, and we also found that this association seem, seems to be stronger, especially in the perimenopausal period. So, you know, obviously we postulated that, uh, um, you know, hormonal turmoil or uh, changes in, uh, in hormones that happen during the um, menopausal transition may play a role. But certainly there is the influence also of social and societal factors in driving some of these differences. So I think there are also many open questions 
um, but that the, the, the explanation given by our colleague, I think, is is uh, extremely um, you know plausible. Great, um, and I think we have two questions related to shift work. Um, one is is whether shift work is um, if we can identify shift workers in the CLSA, and also do you know if the sleep duration measure is valid in shift workers. Um, and then um, uh, a separate question is the relationship with shift work in your findings. Um, so to answer the first question, I'm, I'm, you may know, I'm actually not exactly sure if we ask about shift work in the CLSA. Do either of you know? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's it. I think or Lauren, can recall. <laughs> Lauren Anderson and I say hello to yeah. her. By the way, yeah, hi, Lord. Uh, I have another project with her. Um, so um, yes, we do add information on uh, on on shift work in uh, in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and we have another student, actually Ray Alonso, who, who also contributed to our um, analysis, who is uh, working on the association of shift work with the cognitive um, function within the uh, the same data set. So we do have some information on shift work on you know retirement status of participants. Obviously this is this is an area uh, which is extremely uh, important in occupational epidemiology and there has been you know uh, quite a, a large body of evidence on the uh, increased risk of a range of health outcomes uh, among shift workers. And, and, and some of the mediating mechanism can also be uh, disrupted sleep uh, patterns. Obviously, uh, we, we are you know, expecting to have the possibility to analyze also the longitudinal data uh, to tease out you know, the temporality, all the issues that cannot be sorted with the cross-sectional. Uh, whether or not the sleep duration is a reliable measure uh, among shift workers in this particular data set, I think that's, that's a great question. And, Obviously, we know all the limitation of self-reported information, and and you know, and, and therefore I, I know that there are uh, uh, studies uh, which have attempt to measure um, sleep patterns with with actigraphy, for example, within certain uh, occupational uh, groups. So uh, I think the uh, CLSA dataset may answer some of the questions around. Uh, uh, you know, the importance leap uh, in shift workers, but uh, there are limitations, uh, which I think, you know, um, need to be considered when we interpret the findings that we will produce in this particular population subgroup. And yeah, uh, there was another question, uh, Jennifer, no, about shift work or what? It was just rel um, uh, shift work in, in, your partic in your findings. Yeah, they, they were not including these analysis that Rebecca has uh, discussed, but there is, a, as I mentioned, an additional project uh, that uh, has produced a, a manuscript which will be submitted soon. So, um, so we can, we can uh, you know, we can keep our uh, colleagues um, posted on, on that particular aspect. Um, and we do have about five minutes left. So I just want to remind uh, participants who are, who may need to leave um, to complete their, um, uh, evaluation and the link to that is posted, but we will continue with with questions. We do have several more and if we don't get to them, we will follow up with you after. Um, so the next one from Irving Rootman, uh, is anyone studying the recent total withdrawal of sleep apnea machines manufactured by Philips, which are used by people worldwide? Yeah, we know the, you know, the, the issue and the potential, you know, concern around cancer risk and not to my knowledge and not within our group. Um, so I, I, I'm not able to, you know, and certainly we are not looking at that. Uh, that is a spe specific population subgroup. In our analysis, generally speaking, we have either accounted uh, for people with sleep apnea or we have uh, removed that population because the overall evidence we're trying to produce is to really look at the potential health impact of behavioral sleep in a healthy population. So in people without the diagnosis uh, of a clinical sleep disorder. Uh, because I think that's where I think the public health message uh, will uh, become even uh, more powerful because um, as, as we show, I mean, you know, large segments of the population 
may have um, behavioral sleep problems which are neglected and do not necessarily um, come to the attention of, of health professionals. So I think we are, we are focusing really on the population that uh, is not affected by a clinical diagnosis of a sleep disorder. Uh, there was another question. Uh, yeah, there are, there's actually a few more. Um, one is uh, how are the sleep categories of less than six hours, um, greater than six hours determined? It appears that sleep duration is a distribution with the peak at seven to nine hours and the recommended sleep duration cutoffs, cutoffs are arbitrary. What makes slightly shorter sleep duration, um, 6.5 hours, for example, low normal while less than six hours considered a health risk? I don't know if Rebecca wants to answer that question uh, based on the um, distribution of, uh, of uh, the CLSA data. Um, Rebecca, do you want to say anything? Otherwise, I can... Uh... Um, well, we, we looked at that cutoff um, based on the National Sleep Foundation recommendations. Right, and other previous studies that often use that cutoff. Um, but yeah, if you have anything to add to that, that would be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I, exactly. And you know, obviously, again, this is self-reported information. We know that there is uh, uh, a systematic uh, under, uh, I'm sorry, overestimation of of sleep duration um, in, in in general population. Although without any really affecting the ranking of individuals, so uh, uh, because the bias is basically uh, is not differential across you know uh, different uh, individuals, but Certainly that, you know, obviously these are, these are uh, um, categories which have been uh, uh, widely used in the um, observational epidemiology field. Uh, as Rebecca say, we, we try to, uh, you know, comply with, uh, with the current guidelines. And, and that, you know, obviously there is also inter-individual variability in terms of, you know, sleep dur duration needs uh, across different individuals. But as we said, this is observational epidemiology. So, uh, um, we need to rely on, on self-reported information. Okay, it is one o'clock now, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, unfortunately, we won't get to all the questions. We will follow up with participants who didn't have their questions answered directly after. Um, but I do have a few closing things I do want to make sure we, we uh, get through. Um, so first of all, thank you again to our presenters. We, we really appreciate your um, contributions to these webinar series. Um, it's an important way to promote the CLSA's uh, data, as well as the, the research that's coming out of the CLSA data platform. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, everyone that the September deadline for data access has unfortunately passed. Uh, the next deadline for applications is January 12th of 2022. Um, so please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, including um, the COVID-19 questionnaire study data, as well as additional details about the application process. Um, also, I'd like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the Zoom session. And uh, for the upcoming CLSA webinar, um, it will take place in October. Uh, more details, including the date and registration information, will be posted to the CLSA website. Um, we're just confirming presenters for that one and, and the topic, so you can find out more by visiting the website. Um, and as a, as a reminder, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, so we invite you to follow us on Twitter at uh, CLSA underscore at at CLSA underscore ELCV. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you again for attending today's presentation. Um, and uh, again, we will follow up with uh, uh, in regards to the questions directly after. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>